And I swear by the moon and the stars in the sky that we cuss a lot on Bewitch Banter. You have been warned. Content is not suitable for all listeners. Welcome! You're listening to Bewitch Banter. I'm Krista, and I believe that people are inherently shitty. And I'm Amy, and I tend to believe that people are naturally good. But ironically, I'm a super believer in the supernatural and all things spiritual. And I'm a total skeptic. We're best friends, and in this podcast, we're seeking to explore and understand each other's perspectives with deep dives into the spooky, the spiritual, the magical, and the mystical. And some straight up spoofs. Today, we are covering soulmates. Cheers. Cheers. Or let's do an air cheers. Air cheers. Because we're pretty ching, far ching, away. Ching, ching. We got a new setup, though, in Amy's house. It's badass. Love it. We feel more official. I know. I'm, I'm lounging on the couch. And I'm uh, real comfortable. I'm leading the ship here, captaining the ship here today. <laughs> so I'm in this in the captain's in the chair. Well, it almost could be like you're the therapist. And I'm lounging in the chair. Like oh, the... taking notes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I got a lot to say. This about bitch this, gray. This this bitch gray. <laughs> All right, so soulmates, let's get right into it. It's Valentine's Day week or the week before. We're doing a little celebratory nod to the Hallmark holiday that we're gonna discuss. Why it is now a Hallmark holiday i.e. read total bs i still celebrate it though i only celebrate it in an excuse it's actually i have to did you know that's when Corey asked me out yes i did i know okay. that's your, your like pseudo anniversary not your wedding anniversary yeah not pseudo but you know what i mean your first anniversary what, which is hilarious because i remember i was a nanny at the time and the kids came over the next day and first of all um they looked at my trash like Damn, you had a good time. You guys had two bottles of wine? Oh, and I thought they were going to find condoms. <laughs> no, no. And then, uh, Corey, I was telling my middle school kids, I think, I don't know how it came up, and they're like, Miss Holt, you should be really embarrassed that's your anniversary. What? <laughs> the no woke joke culture? Get out of here. You woke warriors, too. Come on now. <laughs> they're like, you should be, I was like, oh, really? I don't impress you guys? <laughs> Thanks, because you're 12. I'm going to listen to your advice. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, at least they're um ahead of the dare slash no booze situation. But no thanks. That wasn't my lifetime as a 12-year-old, as we know. <laughs> um, all right. So, you know, you know my woo-woo ass loves the idea of love and being in love and lust. And, well, who doesn't? And like just that I'm just a total hopeless romantic classically, even though people are shitty. My heart still wants to believe it in this fairy tale bullshit that we've all been sold. Now, I used to believe, used to, keyword now, believe wholeheartedly also in soulmates. Oh my God, you bought into Hollywood way too much. I did, and I used to believe in them as romantic partners. Um, I still do, I'll get into why I believe in them as other ways, but like, Certainly not as romantic partners, as like, there's a one for everybody. Sorry y'all out there listening on alone on Valentine's Day. Spoiler alert. It's been a tailspun to market ties. Hallmark holiday, that's all I can say. Anyway. Well, I think the whole being monogamous, that is kind of a social structure we've built, and that's not really natural to humankind. Right, right. So same with marriage. Same, like go hand in hand, obviously, with monogamy, so. What is I- it like... 50% of marriages don't last. Oh, girl. Yep, I've got that coming up. I've got I guess the real we're, stat. We're the statistic in the room right now, but there's only two of us. Oh, yep. I'm certainly on the end of that rope. Well, anyway, because of that said divorce, I absolutely don't believe in soulmates um, because I like totally i did at one point but as an ode to valentine's day and all the other single ladies out there like myself i highly urge you and fuck that i implore you to take up uh take that tip from lizzo and be your own soulmate like you got to you know um like the new sex in the city got released which i think you watched right 
I can't. It's a train wreck. It's just what I heard from I you and others. I can't stop watching it. But yeah, it's we're just those. trying to be like woke warriors, and it you can tell it's written by a bunch of white people. Ugh. It's anyway. Well, in the original series, there was that scene where they're like, "Well, maybe we're each other soulmates." And as corny as that is, I do believe now instead of a romantic partner, that soulmates can be best friends siblings other family members even loved ones that have passed that are kind of like your angels that guide us on this shitty plane of earth and i think those are soulmates i don't think it's about love per se anymore um you know and after my recent breakup i uh i just i can't after i was with someone for nearly two decades and it didn't work but during the whole time like i as you well know, I loved that person with all of my heart and soul and the, every fiber of my being. I swore we were soulmates. And I, I truly believe that connection. Um, clearly, I was wrong. And I was kind of laughing to myself because I was like, told Corey, I was like, so the divorced one out of the two of us is one who wanted to do soulmates. And I'm... Yeah. I, I just never... I guess I never even thought about soulmates. I just thought that was like a Hollywood thing. I never even thought of it as such because I, I wanted to want to love and believe in love. And I don't know that I do anymore. Yeah, it's really dark. I still think, I think love's a thing. I just think soulmate is, what, I mean, really at the end of the day, what is a soulmate? I will tell you in okay, a little exactly. bit. But I do have a little V-Day story as well. I know you just shared one, but I should have freaking known then, man. Ooh, okay. So this is back in 2008-ish, 2009-ish. It was Valentine's dinner. Low uh, rise jeans days, right? Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> it, oh, my God, yeah. And your poor shit college students were just made dinner at home and um, or my, my rental house back in the day. Not too far from here, actually. And somehow we're talking about soulmates. And I, again, was the starry-eyed believer back then. And I remember across the dinner table, he said something, I don't know, I don't believe in soulmates. It's kind of bullshit. And obviously... I was a bottle or two wine deep myself that night and I lost it. I was so, I was devastated. And I was like, how can this person that I think is my soulmate not believe in soulmates? And somehow I still continue to turn a blind eye to that. Um, I don't, but I don't, I would argue against that. What do you mean? I mean, he just didn't believe, it doesn't mean something just because they don't believe in soulmates, they didn't love you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not emo- defending him. I'm an emotional being, so I took it as such. And I, I'm not know, defending him. I'm as, just defending the soulmate idea. Yeah, no. And now that I have woke to the fact that it's all BS, I get it now. But back then, I was like heartbroken. I'll never forget it. And sounds like a fun Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> um, so that was my little shitty soulmate personal anecdote but no surprise i was once many one of the many believers out there that was hammered over the head with all sorts of messaging and images and narratives all forms of media as you said hammer us with this myth so because of that it's no surprise that people think they should quote unquote find the one. In fact, this blog that I found, a lot of my research, it was for the Institute of Family Studies called What's Behind a Belief in a Soulmate? And it's by Bradley Onishi. He actually studies, to your point, uh, religious studies at Skidmore College. So there's a lot to be played into my history here about soulmates and religion. Oh, that makes sense. Because I mean, you're... Like in most religions, it's kind of like you're told you need to find that person and then you have kids and Mm -hmm. all that. Yep. Yep. So instead of it going beyond just the pure, like, you know, reproductive, I'm doing the, I'm dry rating in my chair. Yeah, I noticed. (laughs) Sorry. Excuse me, everyone. Um, It's been, it's been a minute. Hopefully that's going to change on Saturday. But anyway, um, (laughs) anyway. It went beyond from that, like primal need to procreate to marriage, which be, then became the economic, like, uh, reason for religions adopting marriage, because they could make money off the certificate. That and um, families would, you know, to to obtain power or keep power and wealth within their families. So it's political and, oh, and economic. Gotcha. Okay. So in this article. 
by Bradley Onishi, he cites that even though Gen Z and Americans in general are having less sex and are marrying far less than our boomer and Gen X parents, um, we are all still seeking a, quote, divine soulmate, despite also not believing in a formal God. So according to a poll by Monomouth, by Monmouth University in West Long Beach, New Jersey, Jersey, nearly two thirds of Americans believe in the existence of soulmates. So that's a big population of well, Americans. I'm not surprised, though. Are you? No, based on all the media we consume, right? It's, it shoves it down our throats and our faces and we're, they tell the narrative that that's the expectation that we should have another half or whatever. But another poll cited from Pew Research Center in 2018 also cited that 9 out of 10 Americans believe in a higher power of some kind, but not God as described in the Bible, end quote. So while people who usually believe more like me in this spiritual concept Mm -hmm. or concepts versus like religious based things, um, they, they don't believe in religion per se but they still believe in the spiritual connection of a soulmate Hmm. um interesting yeah so what was even more interesting about that study in malmouth college was they they respondents cited well wanting a partner that's like them and despite the old opposites attract narrative that we're all again shoved down our throats we've all heard and seen that spouted out at us in in real life it's actually not good to have an opposite partner. Well, you probably, I mean, it makes sense because you'd want to be on the same page, I'm sure, about lots of things like what you want out of life, mm-hmm. how you want to raise your kids, Yep, lifestyle. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Exactly. So the Dr. Gary Le- Lewandowski, who helped uh, lead this study, he's a chair of psychology, said, though romantic belief in soulmates isn't necessarily ideal for your relationship, people still cited wanting this. And research indicates that those who believe in soulmates and destiny are actually more likely to break up. Hello, ding, ding, me. Um, And on the other hand, those who believe that relationships grow over time have much more stable relationships and are better at dealing with conflict. But don't you think the people who are, some? I think there's a Probably, I mean, you might get into it, but I'm thinking there's a lots of characteristics of people who are a very desperate to find the person mm-hmm. uh, to have a soulmate because they feel like they it's like some like their life isn't complete without it. Mm-hmm. Probably are easily swayed more, like uh, yeah, might not look was. at something the whole picture as much. Yeah, you're looking at one, of or them. you could say like people don't look at like they're like anything for love. And sometimes it's like, no, it's not anything for love. That's health, unhealthy and, and toxic. Healthy. Yeah. And you know what's funny is I'll never forget another conversation my Allie and I used to have growing up. And she was always the more problematic one. And girls always had like $100 bills in cash when we were in like fifth grade. I'm like, how the hell? Why? Because she's just great <laughs> at money. But anyway, one of our conversations was, you know, the old debate. Do you believe in love or money? Marrying for love or money? And she was always – lent towards the money of course she wanted to be in love but i was like no i'll always marry for love first look what where, look where that got me and so i had to learn that one the hard way but yeah i think to your point i was super naive because i wanted i had the confirmation bias right i was like oh well i believe in this person they're my soulmate therefore nothing's wrong mm-hmm. bs we know a lot that was untrue so besides media and literature how the hell and where did the concepts of soulmates even begin any ideas? Um, Adam and Eve. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. No, cl- well before them actually. Romeo so, and Juliet. So we'll get, I'll get into that in just a minute. But the early use, an early use of the word, is seen in 1822 by the poet Samuel Taylor in a letter. Sorry, Samuel Taylor Cooleridge in a letter he wrote in 1822, which cited, "To be happy in married life, you must have a soulmate." Mm. That's what Cooleridge proclaimed in his letter. This was a cool and progressive for the time, though, because back then marriage, as I said, was more about control and business deals, allies. Weren't they arranged most of the time? Exactly. Because, they, because again, to keep that power. Mm-hmm. So for the time, Coolidge was like kind of like ahead of it. Like, all right, well, F money, F business. We're going to have marriages for, for love and, and, and soul connection. You know I'm there for that. You know I'm like, okay, yes, I'm into it. Um, Isn't there a lot of people who are 
Like, I thought a lot of people who are, are in arranged marriages are actually very happy, though. Yes, I heard that, too. I don't know. I couldn't cite a fact or whatever, but I have heard that anecdotally. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Like, I right? wonder if their expectations or they just go into the relationship with different expectations. So they're more content and they're not always, like, searching for something or... Yeah, I, I, I just got, I guess that'd be an interesting thing to find out why. That's a really great question. I would love to find out. Yeah, because maybe maybe these are expectations are like they just know this dude is here to provide and give I give family and But I do think some people have very unrealistic expectations for relationships. Oh yeah. And I, that can be Ain't no notebook bullshit up in here, y'all. Sorry to break it to you listening singles out there. Mm-mm-mm. But I think sometimes that can also be a huge detriment to the relationship. They're like, "Oh, they don't swoon me off my or, or like swoop me off my feet every day," and they're like, "That's not real right. life." That's exactly. I have a quote I'll get down to at the end about that. But yeah, it's not. It's certainly not. <laughs> God, whoo, yeah. I wish I could talk to seventeen, eighteen year old Krista, man. I really do, and be like, "Girl." You better run. You better run. You wouldn't have listened, though. You better run. You. Um, I feel like when people try to tell other people what to do with their relationship, it just makes the other the couple's bond stronger. Yeah, totally did. I mean, remember that time you were like, you guys never dated, and we were both like, fuck you. <laughs> oh, you guys got so mad. Yeah. yeah. And, and in that way, I don't know, we were very codependent in a not healthy way. But yeah, I... I because, again, going back to this idea of me thinking this mofo was my soulmate. No. What the <laughs> hell was I doing? I'm out of my damn mind. I'm so mad at myself. But here we are. Things worked out. The universe put me on the track I need to be on. Uh, here we are. All right, so there's still the persistence, though, of this soulmate idea through the contemporary age. Mm-hmm. And the thread of that actually started well before the 1800s letter and poem. In fact, it can be traced back well back to ancient Greek philosophers. So before Jesus, before a budded Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> sexy Jesus. Oh my God, sexy Jesus. Mm. <clears throat> Guys, I'm a little thirsty. <laughs> yeah, we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> As huge, but like extra, extra read all about it, thirsty. <laughs> Hopefully getting satiated soon. Anywho, where are we? Okay, so in Greek times, you have Plato. Plato wrote a book slash collection of essays where um, the the whole collection ended up being called the symposium, but the symposium was actually an event as well where the where the writers would come and speak okay. like lectures basically with all the different philosophers and comedians at the time, and so the symposium's biggest focus was focusing on humans and why why do humans crave soulmates so much and and it examines like why through this entire text why is it just why 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 is the need so bad for us to feel like we need a partner i do think it's natural to want a partner it doesn't have to be always a romantic partner but it's like you want people it's natural to want someone in your life yeah absolutely i think that's very natural companionship yeah, yeah i think so too you know, they say, like, my dad used to like, put me in a cave. I'll be fine. I'm like, hell no. I need I need humans. I would die immediately without another human around. Exactly. Like, maybe I only like so many humans, but I like to be around people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, the real question of this symposium text and event, lecture series, I should say. It was like Plato's TED Talk. NPR in the <laughs> ancient Greek times. Exactly. The real question is... Is love the answer to human suffering, to Mm. end human suffering? So that's what they examined in this. One of the featured authors in Plato's work was the poet Aristophanes. He had quite, speaking of dreamy romantics, quite the lofty vision of love and soulmates. In his speech, he said, Ahem, and grandiose, imagine Greek theater. (laughs) And when one of them meets with his other half, the actual half of himself, the pair are lost in amazement of love and friendship and intimacy, and one will not be without the other's sight, as, may I say, even for a moment. (laughs) Do you like my theater? Yes. Anyway, so clearly Aristophanes was all about that shit. Okay. Into it. Ironically, he was a comedian of the time. Hmm. So 
it was a little interesting. But the historical context behind the quote that Aristophanes said actually came from a mystical, or excuse me, a mythological story um, that all humans were once united with their other half as one being. But because of this, they became too powerful. And they had like two sets of arms and he- heads, legs, everything. So one being with two people. So this is like it. an old folk tale? Yeah. This okay. is a Greek, Greek mythology. Okay. And so they, they, Zeus saw these humans growing and growing and being stronger, frankly, right? With two human bodies fused together. Zeus being the god that he was, said, uh-uh, they're getting way too powerful. I'm splitting y'all. I'm splitting you down the middle. Mm-hmm. And the myth literally cuts humans in halves from the other person, the other half. So you're, you're one person, and then you're two. Okay. And that's the concept of, like, your other half or twin flame, which we'll get to. Oh, so it's like your soulmate. Yeah. Yep. Got it. So you were, you were combined physically at one point. Mm-hmm. Oh, in ancient Greek history. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So Plato, on the other hand, was like not buying any of that bullshit and lofty vision of love and soulmates. So to answer the question why we seek love and romantic connection, um, he couched Aristophanes because he didn't buy it. Plato did not buy this. He he couched Aristophanes' quote and speech in the comedic section of Symposium because he's like, nah, this is a joke. This guy, oh, this guy, like, uh, uh-uh. uh. So that's like an ancient dig. Yeah. And Aristophanes ain't done yet. Listen to this. Okay. Love is born into every human being. It calls back the halves of our original nature together. It tries to make one out of two and heal the wound of human nature. As each of us then is a matching half of a human whole. (laughs) And each of us is always seeking the half that matches him. So he, for a comedian, was pretty, you know, pretty romantic. So... Is love really the answer to life's problems? I'm going to say, hell no. <laughs> sometimes. I'm a little... Um, I feel like love gives a purpose for sometimes, like, all the mad... For all the... Chaos. I guess, like, you justify, like, sometimes, like, the shitty things in life. Yeah. I'm a little bitter right now, as you know. Yeah, I would say, like, relationships, to me, like, without relationships, everything else isn't worth it. Oh, wow. Girl getting most by the oast right here. Yeah. No, I do think love is important though. Um, Cora, get your wife. She's horny. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just playing. <clears throat> no, I don't I, believe in soulmates, but I believe in love. Yeah, I don't believe in love anymore. And I think there's all sorts of anymore. different types of love. Is that bad? Like, hmm? I think I don't believe in love anymore. So you don't love like your mom and dad? No, I believe in familial and friendship love, sure. But like, you've just been burned. Romantic badly. love? It'll happen I'm again. good. It'll for a happen. minute. Two years from now, you'll say you're in love with someone. I hope. You hear us, universe? <laughs> Do you hear me? So I don't think love is really the answer to life's problems. I really don't. I what know, would be the alternative, though? I know it's important, right, to make sense of all the hate and the chaos out there. Yes. But again, I'm just really bitter right now because I have been burned. <laughs> so. <laughs> I know, but don't you think your relationship's... With your friends and your family, make everything oh, worth 100%. it. Oh, one hundred percent. Yes, that's love. Oh yeah, I, I think wouldn't... you're only looking at it in a narrow lens. You're only thinking about romantic love. I know. Well, because again, I'm a hopeless romantic. But there's I'm... all sorts of love, and I think to me, I feel like relationships are number one. Everything. Mm-hmm. Well, self love, right? Relationship with oneself is what I'm learning to do, and that's oh man, it's been the hardest relationship I've ever had to get to know. But I'm loving it. No, don't get me wrong. I'm loving this selfish time in my life. It's amazing mm-hmm. I'm like oh, shit i am my own soulmate this is great i don't have to answer to anybody um and it feels so liberating but no of course i believe in love that was a, that was that was dark but i i'm romantically right now i'm a little peeved so well you're allowed to be anyway <laughs> i think is, you have the right to peeved doesn't really cover way. the amount of anger as you know <laughs> and have seen and experienced so anyway Back to Plato, um, who, again, never bought into the Hollywoodized version of soulmates like so many of us do. No surprise, again, um, that a third of us believe or expect to meet a soulmate or another half. Mm -hmm. I think they said two thirds earlier. So that was a poll. I think this is that was a poll in believing in soulmates in general this is one third of us believing that they will actually meet their soulmate oh two thirds okay and so two thirds in general of the population believe and one third are like 
I'm going to meet that person. Well, and they only did a survey in New Jersey. Like, where were they? Yeah, this might be this might be an American based study. Like, though. where were they surveying these people? That we also a good question. Like, that's a really good point. Regionally, maybe it's different. Who knows? Or just the location where they yeah. like met their quote unquote. They were at a wedding asking people. Oh my! <laughs> imagine. I have a story about that. Speaking of comedians, so in my research, I came across Aziz Ansari had an anecdote in one of his. Oh, I books. love his modern romance book. It's really good. Oh, yeah. So you, then you know this. Have you read it? No. But you should read it as a single person. I will. I will. Um, But so then you're like, I know this quote. But for those listening, it was basically he had gone to a wedding and it was really beautiful. But the vows were so lofty and like so bizarrely romanticized that he's like, through this, I'm not getting married. This this isn't realistic kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, his book's good. What's it called? <laughs> Uh, I think it's called Modern Romance. Okay. But it talks about, the whole book is about a little bit how, I know everyone says dating is harder, but he actually researches it and it is so much harder because it used to be a proximate, proximity thing where you would meet people, you only ventured out so many miles in like a mile, two mile radius, right? Okay. So you were limited to like the local people in your community, but now you're like inundated with several options and hundreds and hundreds of options where people have this fear. It's developed and a lot of it's through online dating. Hmm. It's like they'll meet someone, but they have this fear that there's always something better they're missing out on. Whoa. And so it's made it a lot harder for people to have relationships because there's always this fear like, you're great, but what if there's that one other person on the app? Holy or, shit. So and I think it's it's almost like, uh, they call it choice fatigue. Whoa. Like, there's I even got, like, chills. That's scary. But they even have that, like, uh, Trader Joe's. This is really random. <laughs> but I watched this whole documentary about why they do so well, and it's because they have such limited options. Mm-hmm. Like, humans naturally like to have less options. Yes. So when we're at the grocery store and you're, like, picking out peanut butter and there's 30 things to choose from people get overwhelmed mm-hmm. they don't like that and it's almost the same i don't know why <laughs> i'm not trader joe's but same thing with dating so in a nutshell trader joe's are dicks no <laughs> no they're the good ones they're, just, they're helping you out with no not- i meant like literally what you're saying is i need to get with my eggplant game on trader joe's level Somehow, like, slim down the selection process. <laughs> yes, but that's the whole modern... Ro- you should read those good. It's all about that's that. That's what I was trying to get at. <laughs> I was like, oh, My bad. That's um, all I'm <laughs> Anyway. Was that a dad joke it or was. a bad joke? I think it was. It was both. <laughs> it was both, man. I'm not usually one for that. That's usually your your deal. Anyway, I will read that. But there you yeah, go. Later on down, I have another comment about another show about this. But, all right, we back to Plato, and again, third of us believing they're going to meet their other half, because our culture just promotes it in literally every medium. And every book, every movie ends in the heroes finding their soulmates. Of course, the stories never, ever show what happens post the honeymoon phase, to your point, Mm -hmm. when the work the pain, the trauma, the real life tensions. Unless they have that terrible, terrible movie they made recently with Scarlett Johansson. Oh, I've seen it. And Adam Driver. I can't remember what it's oh, called. Oh, I remember seeing the And promos. Hollywood was so obsessed with it. They're like, it's so realistic. I'm like, no, it's just so boring. Oh. Do they not work out or something? They're getting divorced. I couldn't watch it. It was painful. Oh. Painfully boring, too. Like, Hollywood pro- like was obsessed with it. They are like, it's so realistic. I'm like, no one wants to watch something that's so realistic. Oh, I do. Mm, shit. I'm I mean, it's boring, though. Oh, all right. But then, no, I don't. But uh, anyway, so, you know, again, real life kids. Kids sit in. Their kids are crying. And, and, and like, that, that shit is the test of real love. You know, if you can stick through your partner by their side through that shit. What, kids crying? traumas pain I'm just kidding. yeah I'm no kidding. um <laughs> you those... hear one kid cry and you're gone <laughs> i mean you know that would have been my situation anyway um <laughs> who's bitter <laughs> I was like, do we need a bonus episode where we just unpack everything we could i'd be glad to um <clears throat> anyway listenership of one <laughs> <laughs> no one gives a fuck my therapist <laughs> Uh, who's amazing by the way but anyway um if you stick with your partner in this type of shit that's real love to me not that this i can't hack it bullshit because of my depression who am i talking about i don't know (laughs) i don't know (laughs) 
<laughs> Any examples other than that? I don't know. All uh, right. That's enough of my bullshit. Um, but of course, between the Greek and present times, we have Christian dogma enter religion's impact on soulmates. And of course, it fuels the soulmate narrative further. So just like Hollywood, Christian and Jewish theologists found and used the existential human question of love and desire to find love as a tool to control and own core beliefs of the people, right? Control and how we behave. I never thought about religion and soulmates, but it makes perfect sense Mm -hmm. now. So along similar but separate faiths, um, obviously Jews and Christians are different, um, but they both use erotic and uh, marital metaphors to understand their relationships with God. It's a little weird because they like sexualize God a little bit. So bear with me on this. Okay, I'm like, I'm not following. It gets a little bit weird. Um, So of course, again, different religions, but they do both believe that God is the one true holy force and the key to ending that human suffering and finding yourself, your happiness, and your wholeness. So an example from the Hebrew Bible says, for your maker is your husband. And this essentially means that Israel, the ancient nation, is equated to God's spouse. And this concept continues throughout Israelite history. So the people of Israel know God as Yahweh. Should I be following yet? Because I'm not. Yeah. So you have Israel. (laughs) Okay. The the nation. Okay. And you have God. Okay. Okay. Yahweh is known as God. And Yahweh is the husband. And the people of Israel are supposedly the wife of God. So you're married to God. Yes. Okay. There you go. Thank you for simplifying it. Because I was like, I'm not following. (laughs) Now I am. And so it's kind of weird, but they also continue to say the divine one what or see the divine one, God, Yahweh, as their romantic soulmate. So depicted in a song, uh, I think it's a psalm, but it's called Song of Songs by supposedly a female narrator who writes about her longing for her lover with physical descriptions of the two characters and delights in the way they touch each other's bodies. So like a person and God in this like erotic, poem <laughs> wow because i feel like today if you talked about god like that you would be like we got prude somewhere along the lines i don't know where but yeah we got real prude puritans i think anyway this is a little excerpt you ready for this it gets real freaky deek. <laughs> i'm definitely ready <laughs> all right your channel is an orchid of pomegranates with all the choicest fruits a fountain a well of living water and flowing streams from lebanon <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so this poem, <laughs> super cliche, obviously, like so bad, Fifty Shades level shitty writing mm-hmm. in rom com chiclet bullshit. But I think that was better than Fifty Shades. It was actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fifty Shades was so bad. Yeah, I kept reading, just like Sex in the City. I just, I kept going. I only like, read one, but oh, yeah. Oh, I had no. I read three, I think, or two and a half. One, and I started the second, and I was like, I can't. I was anymore. like, I just can't. And the fuck. Anyway, but I still did it. <laughs> like, the why do I care? This just writing is so bad. So that text that I just read is actually still a huge part of Jewish and Christian scripture, believe it or not. I've never read it. Thank God. No pun intended. But um, anyway, Jewish and Christian philosophers still cite that text as like a major foundation. Wait, is it in the Bible? I don't know. That's actually a really I'm good question. I'm, I'm not a biblical not. scholar, as we know. Um, <laughs> you don't. Want, you didn't memorize the Bible. I was. Thank God, I didn't have to. I we only read little passages here and there in my Catholic catechism classes. C C C D. Anyway, that text is used to like cite the history of Israel in both Christian and Judaism, Christianity and Judaism. Okay. So. So that's interesting. So they would almost fantasize about God? Yes. Like sexually? That's interesting. Isn't that weird? Well, I think it's weird because the for us, it's weird because the only lens we know and people don't do that today. No. <laughs> that I no, because again, we turned puritanical somewhere along the line. I couldn't tell you when I asked Corey. But anyway, the erotic mysticism continues. So we move to Christianity a little bit. Taking God as a human soulmate narrative, their own form of erotica through the Song of Songs. Enter the poet 
origin of Alexandria, who has thought to have lived between 185 and 253. So again, way before Christ. This is like 200 years old on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, He was a mystic who believed that the song was the key to understanding the soul's relationship to Christ. Origen is known as the first Christian theologian as well. So he have, may have coined the term epithelium in his poem, where he wrote that the bride, or wrote of the bride on the way to her bridal chamber. For him, the end of the bridal chamber was God, and the bride was the bride. So he writes, once she receives Jesus, she would then have his divine soulmate till the end of time and be bound to Christ forever. So in the writings, there's erotic terms and really founded a expansive tradition of mystical text um, based in the soul's erotic and marital obsession with Christ. So like, God is my husband. So interesting. Right? Because it's so opposite of what Christians are like today. And I see it a little bit in Catholicism in the way that I was raised in that priests still can't marry because supposedly God is their partner. See, and that seems so outdated to me. Oh, it's so outdated. Look, that's why they're raping little boys over here. It's disgusting. Well, I don't think that's why. I think it's because they have mental sickness. Well, there's, I think initially there's that, but then if you can't have sex, of course, what are you going to do? Well, I just don't even understand why would they make them do that to begin with? Well, because of this myth that God is their soulmate. I know. It's just, come on, let's... Oh, yeah, they need to update that shit. Ain't no doubt about that. But the power of the myth continues, as we know. I thought it was important to take us through that religious lens, though, the old soulmate myth, so we can understand so much why it still persists today and why so many of us still yearn for our soulmate. Even though, like I cited at the top, we still yearn for this partner or other half even though, like, on such a deep spiritual level, even though so many of us are agnostic or atheist. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, right, that that dichotomy, I thought. I know, but I I don't really, I know it definitely has religious roots, but I think it's just ingrained in our culture. It's, like, in our literature. It's Mm -hmm. it's everywhere. Yeah, because of those myths. Yeah. That's why. So it stems all the way back. But I thought, again, it was important to just take us through that. Um, So as we know, the narrative is everywhere, everything we consume kind of beat that horse but the article again by bradley onishi cites the shows like the bachelor and the freaking notebook they all perpetuate guess what revenue that that model of the the romance you know Mm -hmm. genre is frankly revenue driving and so because i'm a single lady i thought i might take us right quick through the online dating app revenue all right in 2020, any guesses on how much the global dating app revenue is? Oh, God. I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, has to be so much money. Uh, I'm going to say, are we in the billions? You, we are. You got it. 15 billion? Not that high, but good guess, uh, knowing what we know about these apps. 3.8 billion. Oh, I said billion. So that's way off. No, billion. Did I say million? Three point eight billion B. Okay, I was gonna say they have to make yeah, tons you're of money. Absolutely right. And uh, it increased very steadily since twenty fifteen when it was just uh one point six nine billion in twenty fifteen. I mean that's still a lot. So it basically doubled. Wow. Into Well, five I think years. it's because it became more normalized. More people are more socially okay with being on dating apps and more people start talking about it yeah so it used to be like hush hush exactly but or like star- or taboo yeah I remember, I remember when i started i tried online dating and like no one would talk about it and i downloaded oh i think it's okay cupid and i was so oh my God, that's where carly met john i was so shout out guys i was so mad though because it somehow it messaged every single one of my contacts to download the app too <laughs> I wanted to die. I was mortified. <laughs> yeah. And I sent it to my ex-boyfriend at the yes. time. Well, I poked a guy by accident. That's nothing like that, though. That, every that's single bad. contact in your phone to download the yeah, app, no, too. Yeah, no, that's bad. That was embarrassing. Yeah. Oof, rough. And that's like the time, games. and that was the time when people weren't really talking about online, online dating. dating. Yeah. I was mortified. I was like, make it stop. Oh, my God. And it just wouldn't stop. I was like, well, 
Too late. Oh my god. Um, and I was mad. I was like, my ex-boyfriend doesn't need to know this to give him the satisfaction of online looking. Oh no. Well, uh, at least you found out <laughs> you were blindsided by like somebody from the past. Like, hey, yeah, let's get this going. <laughs> Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, the, so the apps and the dating sites obviously fool us into thinking that one of these clowns exists, as in soulmate. Insert clunk. Soulmates for clowns. <laughs> I'm still bitter. Um, do they have the clowns only? Oh my god, they might. They probably do. But yeah, so not to mention, this this revenue uh, was topped by Tumble, Tinder and Bumble because they captured the North American market. And they were the most profitable, by by the way. Not, so this is only North American market, not the this whole world? This is global. I was going to say. That's, that's global. But Bumble and Tinder, as we know, are like, they blew up in the last five years. And are their revenue share, basically, they own North America. God, it would be so great to own one of those oh dating God, apps. I know. Well, in my case, on Thursday, I'm going to discuss eHarmony. But also, I'm going to mention... Um, another Netflix show called The One, and it's all about this. And I'm going to save it for my story, but it has to do with the revenue and the ethics behind matching people. eHarmony doesn't seem to be as popular anymore. There's a reason for that, and we will get into it on okay. Thursday. But anywho, um, obviously dating apps are a thing because we're also out there trying to find the soulmate that may or may not exist. And uh, my final thought... Does true love exist, Ames? I think love exists. True love, yeah, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> What's the difference between true love and love? Happy lo- V-Day, Corey. <laughs> What's the difference between true love and love? I think true love is supposed to be like, if we disney it, it's like soulmate. I think it means soulmate. Oh, okay. I was like, I don't really know the difference between true love and love. I think love is true. Got it. Yeah, I'm God, still... that was deep of me. Yeah, it was. I still am... Uh, I think next... Negative Nancy over here. <laughs> I think it'd be interesting, though, to talk about the physiological things that make people feel like they're in love. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't cover that, but I I just... There would... definitely is, there is, like, the pheromones and all the different things mm-hmm. that make people feel like they're in love. We should have Dr. Sis on about that. That would be fun. All right, bonus I mean, does she really study that as a gynecologist? Uh, pheromones, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sex, obviously, she has to help, she has to study sex, you know, to help her, her, I was going to say clients, her patients. <laughs> um, but anyway, I don't know. Jury's out for me if I believe in, in well, you've been burned. romantic love. Yeah. But of course I do believe in soulmates again. Like, I think this is going to get real deep and emotional. So you do believe in soulmates. I believe in soulmates as, as friends, family I believe in, in I believe in love. I don't I think soulmates is a human made up thing. I don't really Yeah, I after doing all this and experiencing what I have, I I agree totally. But and sadly, I think I don't know. I do believe in I do. I'm just like super um uncautious right now because of the way I've been burned. So, I don't know. Which is sad cuz I used to be like such a bright-eyed Romantic. But look, that's how I got burned, so no more. <laughs> yeah. No more. Um, but I was going to say, speaking of friends being soulmates, and this is going, going, oh, going deep. <laughs> Sorry about it. Going there. I've been doing a she lot knows of... this stuff makes me uncomfortable. A lot of self-work and looking within, and I was thinking about it because, you know, obviously, like I said, I thought this person was my soulmate, and throughout the past, I don't know, what, five, six years, so we've been friends... You really help me as a friend and as a woman, like, step into my own power and see that. And you you help me get there. And I don't think – if I hadn't done that, I'd still be in this horrible, toxic relationship. So, I'm proud of you. I'm very I proud of you. To thank you. That's the most emotional part you're going to get out of me tonight. I know. <laughs> Sometimes I get her and she, like, is emotional to me and then I get weirded out. I'm like, yeah, wait, what? But, what? Yeah. You can't do that. That's my, that's my role. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> You're not allowed. But anyway, no, but thank you. And I, and I love you too. But, yeah. Oh, it's... okay. That, I'll take it. I got an I love you. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. But that's that's my story on the old soulmates myth. I loved it. Love. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious what you were going to cover. And then I also was like, how bitter is she going to be when she's talking about soulmates tonight? Ooh. Actually, not as bitter as I thought it was. That's good. What so was think? it therapeutic? 
Yeah, it was. I, I mean, think you did some touch and go, but you did a pretty good job not getting too angry. Yeah, I'm, I'm working through that. I had some really good conversations um, with people I've been talking to, you know, on said Bumble apps. See, I, and, I keep saying if you just date, you'll see there's other fish in the sea. Oh, totally. My eyes are widening so hard. But last night's date, oh, on, uh, like I said, three hours nonstop just chatting. And he had been through a similar situation with his ex-wife where she just completely emotionally abandoned him. Anyway, um, love. Yes, my story, I will tell you my, I'm excited for my stories. They're going to be lighthearted. Okay, good. We need some of that up yeah. in here. So if you are feeling like you need to, you got it out of your system. I do. I feel pretty cathartic. It was a good, it was good. And I'm, I'm working through it, man. We're, we get in there every, one day at a time. What are you doing anything on Valentine's Day? I don't know. Hopefully maybe hanging with this fella that I've been talking to i he hasn't asked me for any plans yet but we're not actually do, i don't know if we'll actually do anything on the day it'll just like the weekend it's the weekday isn't it i think so because we usually and also it's like a million people are out so we'll go celebrate the weekend before okay yeah no i'm not gonna go out hell no we just go expensive. well yeah we don't usually normally go out on the day like we're gonna go on like a bike ride and go out to like our favorite restaurant and that is pretty much our celebration but i count eating good food as a celebration oh yeah absolutely so i think i'll do if that's I'm not, my love that's my love if i'm not getting it <laughs> Second in, love. then i'll be putting food in my face <laughs> How yeah about that? <laughs> i remember the year i was single i on valentine's day i went and signed up for a gym membership oh yeah I was like this is my that's tough love all right yeah I was like that's a present to myself Hell and then yeah. the gym was empty and i was like this is great oh that's very good i will be shoving a cheeseburger and or a pizza down my throat. And then isn't it like Galentine's the day before? Yes, I did that with Abby and a few of our our old coworkers. Oh, that's cute. Before. I've never really done right it. Right before the pandemic. It was February 2020. Crazy. I thought, Valent- I, thought Valent- I thought Valentine's Day is always on the 14th and Galentine's Day is on the 13th. Yeah, February. But like pandemic really in America, we didn't go frenzied until March. Yeah. Because anyway. I, I remember my one year wedding anniversary was the last thing we actually celebrated. And then. Oh, that's right. Yes, because we went out to dinner and that. then like three or four days later, I got sent home from work and that was it. I remember we got sent home and uh-huh. like, it's going to be a week and then it's going to be two weeks and then the rest is, I mean, everyone Two and else, a half years fucking later. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. Or two years later. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, soulmates, they don't exist. Sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, be witches. Peace. Thanks for listening. Check us out on Instagram or bewitchbanter.com. Suggestions for the show? Emails at bewitchbanter at gmail.com. Credits? Music Phantom Fun by Jonathan Boyle from premiumbeat.com. Podcast edited and produced by Kristen Hins and Amy Holt. As always, if you enjoyed, please rate, review, and subscribe.